When a fluorophore molecule is excited, we want it to undergo the process of fluorescence, that is, to emit a photon and drop back to the ground state. However, this doesn't always happen. Whenever the fluorophore is in the excited state, there is some probability that it will undergo a reaction that destroys the fluorophore. This is called photobleaching, defined as the irreversible destruction of fluorophore molecules when they are in the excited state. In fluorescence microscopy, we want to maximize the emission light we collect. As the fluorophores in our sample photobleach, we will collect less and less light and the image will get dimmer. Here's an example of a sample photobleaching. These are LLC-PK1 cells expressing an M emerald tagged EB3 protein imaged on a spinning disc confocal microscope. As the time lapse proceeds, the image gets dimmer as M emerald molecules photobleach. Note that the video is playing on a loop here. When you see the signal come back, that's the video restarting. The photobleaching itself is irreversible. Photobleaching is a problem for many types of experiments. If you are trying to measure fluorescence intensity, this is clearly a major source of error, because the intensity change we see in this example is due to photobleaching, not to any underlying biological phenomenon. But even if you're not measuring intensity, photobleaching can complicate your experiments. In this case, at some point in the time lapse, we can no longer get any useful information from the images because we've just lost too much fluorophore. There are two key things to know about photobleaching that will help you design your experiment and choose appropriate fluorophores. First, photobleaching requires excitation. If you are not exciting your fluorophores, they won't photobleach. On the other hand, anytime you excite your fluorophores, photobleaching will happen. For example, if you're staring at your gorgeous samples through the eyepieces with the fluorescence illumination on, you are exciting fluorophores, and some of them are photobleaching. Second, fluorophores vary in their photostability. Fluorophores that are more photostable have a lower probability of photobleaching per excitation event. The more photostable your fluorophore, the more images you can acquire before significant bleaching occurs. Here's an example of how photobleaching compares between some selected fluorophores. On the y-axis, we have the light output of the sample in photons per molecule per second. The researchers have normalized their data so that the approximate rate of excitation is the same for all the fluorophores. Then, they kept the fluorophores under constant illumination with the appropriate excitation light and measured the intensity over time. Each curve here represents a different fluorophore. You can see that the photobleaching rates vary a lot between fluorophores. After 100 seconds, for example, the yellow curve is down to about 3% of its initial intensity, indicating that 97% of the fluorophores have photobleached, whereas the green curve still retains about 70% of its initial fluorescence. This type of photobleaching curve is often summarized with a T1 half measurement. T1 half is the time at which the fluorophore intensity is one half of the initial intensity. The larger the T1 half, the more photostable the fluorophore is. However, we have to be very cautious about how we interpret these measurements. Photobleaching rate, and therefore T1 half, depend on illumination conditions. T1 half values measured under different conditions can't be compared. Remember that every time a fluorophore is excited, it has some chance of photobleaching. If you deliver more excitation light, more excitation events will occur, and the photobleaching rate will increase. In the graph I'm showing here, all of the curves were measured under comparable conditions, so we can compare the T1 half values. But if you see a T1 half value reported on its own, remember that you can't compare it with other T1 half values unless you know that they were measured under the same conditions. For practical purposes, this means you shouldn't compare T1 half values from different publications. Fortunately, what we care about most of the time isn't the absolute photostability of a fluorescent protein, but rather how it performs under the specific experimental conditions that we will be using. The best way to determine whether a fluorophore is photostable enough for your experiment is to test it yourself. Let's return to our photobleaching example. This is a time-lapse experiment where I've collected one image every second for about two minutes. By the end of the time lapse, the image is too dim to use. I can no longer detect the structures I'm interested in. Even if I'm not planning to measure intensity here, I'm limited in how many frames of this time lapse I can use. So, what can I do to decrease the amount of photobleaching? 
Here are some practical tips. First, use bright fluorophores. The brighter the fluorophores, the less excitation light you'll need to generate a usable image. If you were to use a dim fluorophore with similar photostability, you'd need to use more excitation light and you'd end up with faster photo bleaching. Second, try a few different fluorophores rather than sticking with the first one you find. Measuring and comparing the innate photostability of fluorophores is difficult, but comparing the photo bleaching rates you end up with at your own microscope is straightforward. Try your experiment with a few different fluorophores and pick one that doesn't bleach too quickly under your experimental conditions. Third, minimize illumination. Pay attention to illumination both during your experiment and before you start acquiring. During your experiment, use the lowest exposure time and illumination intensity you can, and make sure you're not acquiring more frequently than you need to. In my EB3 experiment, for example, I could try taking images less frequently, say every five seconds instead of every second, and extend the duration of my time lapse. I could also try decreasing my exposure time and illumination power to see whether I could still detect the structures I'm interested in. You should also avoid bleaching your sample before you even collect an image. For example, use bright field to focus rather than fluorescence and minimize use of the live acquisition mode. If you must look at your samples through the eyepieces, work quickly and make sure you turn off the illumination when you're not looking. Finally, if you're working with fixed samples, use a mounting media that contains an anti-photo bleaching reagent. These are chemicals that decrease the likelihood of photo bleaching. Most commercial mounting medias designed for fluorescence contain an anti-photo bleaching reagent. Just make sure that the reagent used in the media is compatible with the fluorophores you are using. This information can be found in the documentation for the mounting media.